the Mahabharata. Section Lzi. Samhava Parva continued. Kanwe continued, and Sakra, thus addressed by her, then commanded him. Who could approach every place, viz., the god of the wind, to be present? With Manaka at the time she would be before the Rishi. And the timid end. Beautiful Manaka then entered the retreat and saw there Visvamitra who had burnt, by his penances, all his sins, and was engaged still in ascetic penances. And saluting the Rishi, she then began to sport before him. And just at that time Marut robbed her of her garments that were white as the moon. And she thereupon ran, as if in great bashfulness, to catch hold of her attire, and as if she was exceedingly annoyed with Marut. And she did all this before the very eyes of Visvamitra who was endued with energy like that of fire. And Visvamitra saw her in that attitude. And beholding her divested of her robes, he saw that she was of faultless feature. And that best of Muna saw that she was exceedingly handsome, with no marks of age on her person. And beholding her beauty and accomplishments that bull amongst rishis was possessed with lust and made a sign that he desired her companionship. And he invited her accordingly, and she also of faultless features expressed her acceptance of the invitation. And they then passed a long time there in each other's company, and sporting with each other, just as they pleased, for a long time as if it were only a single day, the Rishi begot on Manaka a daughter named Sakantala. And Manaka, as her conception advanced, went to the banks of the river Malini coursing along a valley of the charming mountains of Himavit. And there she gave birth to that daughter. And she left the newborn infant on the bank of that river and went away. And beholding the newborn infant lying in that forest destitute of human beings but abounding with lions and tigers, a number of vultures sat around to protect it from harm. No rax hosses or carnivorous animals took its life. Those vultures protected the daughter of Manaka. I went there to perform my ablution and beheld the infant lying in the solitude of the wilderness surrounded by vultures. Bringing her hither I have made her my daughter. Indeed, the maker of the body, the protector of life, the giver of food, are all three, fathers in their order, according to the scriptures. And because she was surrounded in the solitude of the wilderness, by Sakantas, birds, therefore, hath she been named by me. Sakantala, bird protected. O Brahman, learn that it is thus that Sakantala hath become my daughter. And the faultless Sakantala also regards me as her father. This is what my father had said unto the Rishi, having been asked by him. O king of men, it is thus that thou must know I am the daughter of Kanwe. And not knowing my real father, I regard Kanwe as my father. Thus have I told thee, O king, all that hath been heard by me regarding my birth. Section Lz8. Samhava Parva continued. Visampayana continued, King Dushmanta, hearing all this, said. Well spoken, O princess, this that thou hast said. Be my wife, O oh, beautiful one. What shall I do for thee? Golden garlands, robes. Earrings of gold, white and handsome pearls, from various countries. Golden coins, finest carpets, I shall present thee this very day. Let the whole of my kingdom be thine today, O beautiful one. Come to me, O timid one, wedding me, O beautiful one, according to the Gandhar form. O thou of tapering thighs, of all forms of marriage, the Gandhar one is regarded as the first. Sakantala, hearing this, said, O king, my father hath gone away from this asylum to bring fruit. Wait but a moment, 
he will bestow me on thee. Dushmanta replied, O beautiful and faultless one, I desire that thou shouldst be my life's companion. Know thou that I exist for thee, and my heart is in thee. One is certainly one's own friend, and one certainly may depend upon one's own self. Therefore, according to the ordinance, thou canst certainly bestow thyself. There are, in all, eight kinds of marriages. These are Brahma, Deva, Arsha, Prajapatya, Azura, Gandharv, Raksasa, and Pesacha, the eighth. Manu, the son of the self create hath spoken of the appropriateness of all these forms according to their order. Know, O faultless one, that the first four of these are fit for Brahmanas, and the first six for Kshatriyas. As regards kings, even the Rakshasa form is permissible. The Azura form is permitted to Vaishas and Sudras. Of the first five the three are proper, the other two being improper. The Pais Acha and the Azura forms should never be practiced. These are the institutes of religion, and one should act according to them. The Gandharv and the Rakshasa form are consistent with the practices of Kshatriyas. Thou needst not entertain the least fear. There is not the least doubt that either according to any one of these last mentioned forms, or according to a union of both of them, are Wedding may take place. O thou of the fairest complexion, full of desire. I am, thou also in a similar mood mayst become my wife according to the Gandhar form. Sakantala, having listened to all this, answered, If this be the course sanctioned by religion, if, indeed, I am my own disposer, here, O thou foremost one of Pura's race, what my terms are. Promise truly to give me what I ask thee. The son that shall be begotten on me shall become thy heir apparent. This, O king, is my fixed resolve. O Dushmanta, if thou grant this, then let our union take place. Vaisampayana continued, the monarch, without taking time to consider at once told her, let it be so. I will even take thee, O thou of agreeable smiles, with me to my capital. I tell thee truly. O beautiful one, thou deservest all this. And so saying, that first of kings wedded the handsome Sakantala of graceful gait, and knew her as a husband. And assuring her duly, he went away, telling her repeatedly, I shall send thee, for thy escort, my troops of four classes. Indeed, it is even thus, that I shall take thee to my capital, O thou of sweet smiles. Vaisampayana continued, O Janamejaya, having promised so unto her, the king went away. And as he retraced his way homewards, he began to think of Kajyapa. And he asked himself, What will the illustrious ascetic say? After he has known all, Thinking of this, he entered his capital. The moment the king had left, Kanwe arrived at his abode. But Sakantala, from a sense of shame, did not go out to receive her father. That great ascetic, however, possessed of spiritual knowledge, knew all. Indeed, beholding everything with his spiritual eye, the illustrious one was pleased, and addressing her, said, Amiable one, what hath been done by thee today in secret, without having waited for me viz, intercourse with a man hath not been destructive of thy virtue. Indeed, union, according to the Gandhar form, of a wishful woman with a man of sensual desire, without mantras of any kind, it is said, is the best for Kshatriyas. That best of men, Dushmanta, is also high-souled and virtuous. Thou hast, O Sakantala, accepted him for thy husband. The son 
that shall be born of thee shall be mighty and illustrious in this world. And he shall have sway over the sea. And the forces of that illustrious king of kings, while he goeth out against his foes shall be irresistible. Sakantala then approached her fatigued father and washed his feet. And taking down the load he had with him and placing the fruits in proper order, she told him, It behoveth thee to give thy grace to that Dushmanta whom I have accepted for my husband, as well as his ministers. Kanwe replied, O thou of the fairest complexion, for thy sake I am inclined to bless him. But receive from me, O blessed one, the boon that thou desirest. Visampayana continued, Sakantala, thereupon, moved by desire of benefiting Dushmanta, asked the boon that the Purava monarchs might ever be virtuous and never deprived of their thrones. Section Lziv Samhava Parva continued. Visampayana said, after Dushmanta had left the asylum having made those promises unto Sakantala, the latter of tapering thighs brought forth a boy of immeasurable energy. And when the child was three years old, he became in splendour like the blazing fire. And, O Janam Jaya, he was possessed of beauty and magnanimity and every accomplishment. And that first of virtuous men, Kanway, caused all the rites of religion to be performed in respect of that intelligent child thriving day by day. And the boy gifted with pearly teeth and shining locks, capable of slaying lions even then, with all auspicious signs on his palm, and broad, expansive forehead, grew up in beauty and strength. And like unto a celestial child in splendour, he began to grow up rapidly. And when he was only six years of age, endued with great strength he used to seize and bind to the trees that stood around that asylum, lions and tigers and bears and buffaloes and elephants. And he rode on some animals, and pursued others in sportive mood. The dwellers at Canway's asylum thereupon bestowed on him a name. And they said, because he seizes and restrains an animals however strong, let him be called Sarvatamana, the subduer of all. And it was thus that the boy came to be named Sarvatamana, in Dud, as he was with prowess and energy and strength. And the Rishi seeing the boy and marking also his extraordinary acts, told Sakantala that the time had come for his installation as the heir apparent. And beholding the strength of the boy, Kanwe commanded his disciples, saying, Bear yet, without delay the Sakantala with her son from this abode to that of her husband, blessed with every auspicious sign. Women should not live long in the houses of their paternal or maternal relations. Such residence is destructive of their reputation, their good conduct, their virtue. Therefore, delay not in bearing her hence. These disciples of the Rishi. Thereupon, saying so be it, went towards the city named after an elephant, Hastinapura, with Sakantala and her son ahead of them. And then, she of fair eyebrows, taking with her that boy of celestial beauty, endued with eyes like lotus petals, left the woods where she had been first known by Dushmanta. And having approached the king, she with her boy resembling in splendour the rising sun was introduced to him. And the disciples of the Rishi having introduced her, returned to the asylum. And Sakantala having worshipped the king according to proper form, told him, This is thy son, O king. Let him be installed as thy heir apparent. O king, this child, like unto a celestial, hath been begotten by thee upon me. Therefore, O best of men, fulfill now the promise thou gavest me. Call to mind, O thou of great good fortune, the agreement thou hadst made on the occasion of thy union with me in the asylum of Canway. The king, hearing these her words, and remembering everything said, I 
do not remember anything. Who art thou, O wicked woman in ascetic guise? I do not remember having any connection with thee in respect of Dharma. Kama and Arthas. Go or stay or do as thou pleasest. Thus addressed by him, the fair-colored innocent one became abashed. Grief deprived her of consciousness and she stood for a time like an wooden post. Soon, however, her eyes became red like copper and her lips began to quiver. And the glances she now and then cast upon the king seemed to burn the latter. Her rising wrath however, and the fire of her asceticism, she extinguished within herself by an extraordinary effort. Collecting her thoughts in a moment, her heart possessed with sorrow and rage, she thus addressed her lord in anger, looking at him, knowing everything, Oh! Monarch, how canst thou, like an inferior person, thus say that thou knowest it not? Thy heart is a witness to the truth or falsehood of this matter. Therefore, speak truly without degrading thyself. He who being one thing representeth himself as another thing to others, is like a thief and a robber of his own self. Of what sin is he not capable? Thou thinkest that thou alone hast knowledge of thy deed. But knowest thou not that the ancient, omniscient one, Narayana, liveth in thy heart? He knoweth all thy sins, and thou sinnest in his presence. He that sins thinks that none observes him. But he is observed by the gods and by him. Also who is in every heart. The sun, the moon, the air, the fire, the earth, the sky, water, the heart, yama, the day, the night, both twilights, and dharma, all witness the acts of man. Yama, the son of Surya, takes no account of the sins of him with whom Narayana the witness of all acts, is gratified. But he with whom Narayana is not gratified is tortured for his sins by Yama. Him who degradeth himself by representing his self falsely, the gods never bless. Even his own soul blesseth him. Not. I am a wife devoted to my husband. I have come of my own accord, it is true. But do not, on that account, treat me with disrespect. I am thy wife and, therefore, deserve to be treated respectfully. Wilt thou not treat me so, because I have come hither of my own accord? In the presence of so many, why dost thou treat me like an ordinary woman? I am not certainly crying in the wilderness. Dost thou not hear me? But if thou refuse to do what I supplicate thee for, O Dushmanta, thy head this moment shall burst into a hundred pieces. The husband entering the womb of the wife cometh out himself in the form of the son. Therefore is the wife called by those cognizant of the Vedas as Jaya, she of whom one is born and the son that is so born unto persons cognizant of the Vedic mantras rescueth the spirits of deceased ancestors. And because the son rescueth ancestors from the hell call put, therefore, hath he been called by the self create himself as Putra, the rescuer from put. By a son one conquereth the three worlds. By a son's son, one enjoyeth eternity. And by a grandson's son great-grandfathers enjoy everlasting happiness. She is a true wife who is skillful in household affairs. She is a true wife who hath borne a son. She is a true wife whose heart is devoted to her Lord. She is a true wife who knoweth none but her Lord. The wife is a man's half. The wife is the first of friends. The wife is the root of religion, profit, and desire. The wife is the root of salvation. They that have wives can perform religious acts. They that have wives can lead domestic lives. They that have wives have the means to be cheerful. They that have wives can achieve good fortune. 
sweet speeched wives are friends on occasions of joy. They are as fathers on occasions of religious acts. They are mothers in sickness and woe. Even in the deep woods to a traveler a wife is his refreshment and solace. He that hath a wife is trusted by all. A wife, therefore, is one's most valuable possession. Even when the husband leaving this world goeth into the region of Yama, it is the devoted wife that accompanies him thither. A wife going before waits for the husband. But if the husband goeth before, the chaste wife followeth close. For these reasons, O king, doth marriage exist. The husband enjoyed the companionship of the wife both in this and in the other worlds. It hath been said by learned persons that one is himself born as one's son. Therefore, a man whose wife hath born a son should look upon her as his mother. Beholding the face of the son one hath begotten upon his wife, like his own face in a mirror, one feeleth as happy as a virtuous man, on attaining to heaven. Men scorched by mental grief, or suffering under bodily pain, feel as much refreshed in the companionship of their wives as a perspiring person in a cool bath. No man, even in anger, should ever do anything that is disagreeable to his wife, seeing that happiness, joy and virtue dash everything dependeth on the wife. A wife is the sacred field in which the husband is born himself. Even rishis cannot create creatures without women. What? Happiness is greater than what the father feeleth when the son running towards him, even though his body be covered with dust, clas peth his limbs. Why then dost thou treat with indifference such a son, who hath approached thee himself and who casteth wistful glances towards thee for climbing thy knees? Even ants support their own eggs without destroying them, then why shouldst not thou, a virtuous man that thou art, support thy own child? The touch of soft sandal paste, of women, of cool water, is not so agreeable as the touch of one's own infant son locked in one's embrace. As a brahmana is the foremost of all bips, a cow, the foremost of all quadrupeds, a protector, the foremost of all superiors, so is the son the foremost of all objects, agreeable to the touch. Let, therefore, this handsome child touch thee in embrace. There is nothing in the world more agreeable to the touch than the embrace of one's son. O chastiser of foes, I have brought forth this child, O monarch, capable of dispelling all thy sorrows after bearing him in my womb for full three years. O oh. monarch of Pura's race, he shall perform a hundred horse sacrifices. These were the words uttered from the sky when I was in the lying-in room. Indeed, men going into places remote from their homes take up their others' children on their laps and smelling their heads feel great happiness. Thou knowest that Brahmanas repeat these Vedic mantras on the occasion of the consecrating rites of infancy dash thou art born, O son, of my body. Thou art sprung from my heart. Thou art myself in the form of a son. Live thou to a hundred years. My life dependeth on thee, and the continuation of my race also, on thee. Therefore, O son, live thou in great happiness to a hundred years. He hath sprung from thy body, this second being from thee. Behold thyself in thy son, as thou beholdest thy image in the clear lake. As the sacrificial fire is kindled from the domestic one, so hath this one sprung from thee. Though one, thou hast divided thyself. In course of hunting while engaged in pursuit of the deer, I was approached by thee, O. Oh, King, I who was then a virgin in the asylum of my father. Urvazi. Puravachita, Sahajanya, Manaka, Viswakya, and Gritakya, these are the six. Foremost of Apsaras. 
Amongst them again, Manaka, born of Brahman, is the first descending from heaven on earth, after intercourse with Visvamitra, she gave birth to me. That celebrated Apsara, Manaka, brought me forth in a valley of Himavit. Bereft of all affection, she went away. Cast me there as if I were the child of somebody else. What sinful act did I do, of old, in some other life that I was in infancy cast away by my parents and at present am cast away by thee? Put away by thee, I am ready to return to the refuge of my father. But it behoveth thee not to cast off this child who is thy own. Hearing all this, Dushmanta said, O Sakantala, I do not know having begot upon thee this son. Women generally speak untruths. Who shall believe in thy words? Destitute of all affection, the lewd Manaka is thy mother, and she cast thee off on the surface of the Himavit as one throws away, after the worship is over, the flowery offering made to his gods. Thy father too of the Kshatriya race, the lustful Visvamitra, who was tempted to become a Brahmana, is destitute of all affection. However, Manaka is the first of Apsaras, and thy father also is the first of Rishis. Being their daughter, why dost thou speak like a lewd woman? Thy words deserve no credit. Art thou not ashamed to speak them, especially before me? Go hence, O wicked woman in ascetic guise. Where is that? Foremost of great Rishis, where also is that Apsara Manaka? And why art thou, low as thou art, in the guise of an ascetic? Thy child too is grown up. Thou sayest he is a boy, but he is very strong. How hath he soon grown like a sala sprout? Thy birth is low. Thou speakest like a lewd woman. Lustfully hast thou been begotten by Manaka. O woman of ascetic guys, all that thou sayest is quite unknown to me. I don't know thee. Go. Whithersoever thou choosest. Sakantala replied, Thou seest, O king, the fault of others, even though they be as small as a mustard seed. But seeing, thou noticest not thy own faults even though they be as large as the vilway fruit. Manaka is one of the celestials. Indeed, Manaka is reckoned as the first of celestials. My birth, therefore, O Dushmanta, is far higher than thine. Thou walkest upon the earth, O king, but I roam in the skies. Behold, the difference between ourselves is as that between the mountain, Meru and a mustard seed. Behold my power, O king. I can repair to the abodes of Indra, Kavera, Yama, and Varana. The saying is true which I shall refer to. Before thee, O sinless one. I refer to it for example's sake and not from evil motives. Therefore, it behoveth thee to pardon me after thou hast heard it. An ugly person considereth himself handsomer than others until he sees his own face in the mirror. But when he sees his own ugly face in the mirror, it is then that he perceiveth the difference between himself and others. He that is really handsome never taunts anybody. And he that always talketh evil beko metha reviler. And as the swine always look for dirt and filth even when in the midst of a flower garden, so the wicked always choose the evil out of both evil and good that others speak. Those however, that are wise, on hearing the speeches of others that are intermixed with both good and evil, accept only what is good, like geese, that always extract the milk only, though it be mixed with water. As the honest are always pained at speaking ill of others, so do the wicked always rejoice in doing the same thing. As the honest always feel pleasure in showing regard for the old, so do the wicked always take delight in aspersing the good. 
The honest are happy in not seeking for faults. The wicked are happy in seeking for them. The wicked ever speak ill of the honest. But the latter never injure the former, even if injured by them. What can be more ridiculous in the world than that those that are themselves wicked should represent the really honest as wicked? When even atheists are annoyed with those that have fallen off from truth and virtue and who are really like angry snakes of virulent poison, what shall I say of myself who am nurtured in faith? He that having begotten a son who is his own image, regardeth him not, never attaineth to the worlds he coveteth, and verily the gods destroy his good fortune and possessions. The Patris have said that the son continueth the race and the line and is, therefore, the best of all religious acts. Therefore, none should abandon a son. Manu hath said that there are five kinds of sons, those begotten by oneself upon his own wife, those obtained, as gift, from others, those purchased for a consideration, those reared with affection and those begotten upon other women than upon wedded wives. Sons support the religion and achievements of men, enhance their joys, and rescue deceased ancestors from hell. It behoveth thee not, therefore, O tiger among kings, to abandon a son who is such. Therefore, O Lord of earth, cherish thy own self, truth, and virtue by cherishing thy son. O lion among monarchs, it behoveth thee not to support this deceitfulness. The dedication of a tank is more meritorious than that of a hundred wells. A sacrifice again is more meritorious than the dedication of a tank. A son is more meritorious than a sacrifice. Truth is more meritorious than a hundred sons. A hundred horse sacrifices had once been weighed against truth, and truth was found heavier than a hundred horse sacrifices. O king, truth, I ween, may be equal to the study of the entire Vedas and ablutions in all holy places. There is no virtue equal to truth, there is nothing superior to truth. O king, truth is God himself, truth is the highest vow. Therefore, violate not thy pledge, O monarch. Let truth and thee be even united. If thou placest no credit in my words, I shall of my own accord go hence. Indeed, thy companionship should be avoided. But thou, O Dushmanta, that when thou art gone, this son of mine shall rule the whole earth surrounded by the four seas and adorned with the king of the mountains. Visampayana continued, Sakuntala having spoken to the monarch in this wise, left his presence. But as soon as she had left, a voice from the skies, emanating from no visible shape, thus spoke unto Dushmanta as he was sitting surrounded by his occasional and household priests, his preceptors, and ministers. And the voice said, The mother is but the sheath of flesh, the son sprung from the father is the father himself. Therefore, O Dushmanta, cherish thy son, and insult not Sakuntala. O best of men, the son, who is but a form of one's own seed, rescueth ancestors, from the region of Yama. Thou art the progenitor of this boy. Sakuntala hath spoken the truth. The husband, dividing his body in twain, is born of his wife in the form of son. Therefore, O Dushmanta, cherish. O monarch, thy son born of Sakuntala. To live by forsaking one's living. Son is a great, misfortune. Therefore, O thou of Pura's race, cherish thy high-souled son born of Sakuntala and because this child is to be cherished by thee even at our word, therefore shall this thy son be known by the name of Bharata, the cherished, dot. Hearing these words uttered by the dwellers in heaven, the monarch of Pura's race became overjoyed and spoke as follows unto his priests and ministers, hear ye these words. 
uttered by the celestial messenger? I myself know this one to be my son. If I had taken him as my son on the strength of Sakantala's words alone, my people would have been suspicious and my son also would not have been regarded as pure. Vaisampayana continued, the monarch, then, O thou of Bharata's race! Seeing the purity of his son established by the celestial messenger, became exceedingly glad. And he took unto him that son with joy. And the king with a joyous heart then performed all those rites upon his son that a father should perform. And the king smelled his child's head and hugged him with affection. And the brahmanas began to utter blessings upon him. And the bards began to applaud him. And the monarch then experienced the great delight that one feeleth at the touch of one's son. And Dushmanta also received mad wife of his with affection. And he told her these words, pacifying her affectionately, O goddess, my union with the took place privately therefore, I was thinking of how best to establish thy purity. My people might think that we were only lustfully united and not as husband and wife, and therefore, this son that I would have installed as my heir apparent would only have been regarded as one of impure birth. And dearest, every hard word thou hast uttered in thy anger, have I, O oh, large-eyed one, forgiven thee. Thou art my dearest. And the royal sage, Dushmanta, having spoken thus unto his dear wife, O Bharata, received her with offerings of perfume, food, and drink. And King Dushmanta, then, bestowed the name of Bharata upon his child, and formally installed him as the heir apparent. And the famous and bright wheels of Bharata's car, invincible and like unto the wheels of the cars owned by the gods, traversed every region, filling the whole earth with their rattle. And the son of Dushmanta reduced to subjection all kings of the earth. And he ruled virtuously and earned great fame. And that monarch of great prowess was known by the titles of Chakravarti and Sarvabhauma. And he performed many sacrifices like Sakra, the lord of the Maruts. And Kanwe was the chief priest at those sacrifices, in which the offerings to Brahmanas were great. And the blessed monarch performed both the cow and the horse sacrifices. And Bharata gave unto Kanwe a thousand gold coins as the sacerdotal fee. It is that Bharata from whom have emanated so many mighty achievements. It is from him that the great race called after him. In his race are called after him. And in the Bharata race there have been born many godlike monarchs gifted with great energy, and like unto Brahman himself. Their number cannot be counted. But, O thou of Bharata's race, I shall name the principal ones that were blessed with great good fortune, like unto the gods, and devoted to truth and honesty. Section LXXV Samhava Parva continued. Vaisampayana said, Hear now, as I recite the recorded genealogy, that is sacred and subservient to religion, profit, and pleasure, of these royal sages Daksha, the lord of creation, Manu, the son of Surya, Bharata, Ruru, Puru, and Ajamidha. I shall also recite to thee, O sinless one, the genealogies of the Yadvas and of the Kurus and of the king of the Bharata line. These genealogies are sacred and their recitation is a great act of propitiation. That recitation conferreth wealth, fame and long life. And, O sinless one, all these I have named shown in their Splendour and were equal unto the great rishis in energy. Prachetas had ten sons who were all devoted to asceticism and possessed of every virtue. They burnt, of old, by the fire emanating from their mouths, several plants of poisonous and innumerable large trees that had covered the earth and became a source of great discomfort to man. After these ten, was born another named Daksha. It is from Daksha that all 
creatures have sprung. Therefore is he, O tiger among men, called the grandfather. Born of Prachetas the Muni Daksha, uniting himself with Virani, begot a thousand sons of rigid vows, all like himself. And Narada taught these thousand sons of Daksha the excellent philosophy of Sankhya as a means of salvation. And, O Janamjaya, the lord of creation, Daksha. Then, from the desire of making creatures, begot fifty daughters. And he made all of them his appointed daughters, so that their sons might be his sons also for the performance of all religious acts. And he bestowed ten of his daughters on Dharma, and thirteen on Kajyapa. And he gave twenty-seven to Chandra, who are all engaged in indicating time. And Kajyapa, the son of Marishi, begot on the eldest of his thirteen wives. The Adityas, the celestials endued with great energy and having Indra as their head and also Vivasvat, the son. And of Vivasvat was born the Lord. Yama. And Murthanda, Vivasvat, also begot another son after Yama, gifted with great intelligence and named Manu. And Manu was endued with great wisdom and devoted to virtue. And he became the progenitor of a line. And in Manu's race have been born all human beings, who have, therefore, been called Manavas. And it is of Manu that all men including Brahmanas, Kshatriyas, and others have been descended, and are, therefore, all called Manavas. Subsequently, O monarch, the Brahmanas became united with the Kshatriyas. And those sons of Manu that were Brahmanas devoted themselves to the study of the Vedas. And Manu begot ten other children. Named Veena, Trishnu, Narishyan, Nabhaga, Ikshvaku, Karusha, Suryati, the eighth, a daughter named Ila, Prishatru the ninth, and Nabhagarishta, the tenth. They all betook themselves to the practices of Kshatriyas. Besides these, Manu had fifty other sons on earth. But we heard that they all perished, quarreling with one another. The learned Purirabhas was born of Isla. It hath been heard by us that Isla was both his mother and father. And the great Purirabhas had sway over thirteen islands of the sea. And, though a human being, he was always surrounded by companions that were superhuman. And Puriravas intoxicated with power quarreled with the Brahmanas and little caring for their anger robbed them of their wealth. Beholding all the Sanat Kumara came from the region of Brahman and gave him good counsel, which was, however, rejected by Puriravas. Then the wrath of the great Rishis was excited, and the avaricious monarch, who intoxicated with power, had lost his reason, was immediately destroyed by their curse. It was Puriravas who first brought from the region of the Gandharvs the three kinds of fire, for sacrificial purpose. And he brought thence, the Apsara Urvazi also. And the son of Ilo begot upon Urvazi six sons who were called Aus, Dhimat, Amavasu, Andradeos, and Vanaios, and Saitaos. And it is said that Aus begot four sons named Nahusha, Vridhasarman, Rajangaya, and Anenas, on the daughter of Swarbanu. And, O monarch, Nahusha, of all the sons of Aus, being gifted with great intelligence and prowess ruled his extensive kingdom virtuously. And king, Nahusha supported evenly the Pitris, the Celestials, the Rishis, the Brahmanas, the Gandharvs, the Nagas, the Rakshasas, the Kshatriyas, and the Vaishas. And he suppressed all robber gangs with a mighty hand. But he made the Rishis pay tribute and carry him on their backs like bests of burden. And, conquering the very gods by the beauty of his person, his asceticism, prowess, and energy, he ruled as if he were Indra himself. 
and Nahusha begot six sons, all of sweet speech, named Yatai, Yayati, Sanyati, Ayati, and Dhruva. Yatai Beta King himself to asceticism became a Muni like unto Brahman himself. Yayati became a monarch of great prowess and virtue. He ruled the whole earth, performed numerous sacrifices, worshipped the Pitris with great reverence, and always respected the gods. And he brought the whole world under his sway and was never vanquished by any foe. And the sons of Yayati were all great bowmen and resplendent with every virtue. And, O king, they were begotten upon his two wives, Devyani and Sarmishtha. And of Devyani were born Yadu and Turvesu, and of Sarmishtha were born Drahayu, Anu, and Puru. And, O king, having virtuously ruled his subjects for a long time, Yayati was attacked with a hideous decrepitude destroying his personal beauty and attacked by decrepitude. The monarch then spoke, O Bharata, unto his sons Yadu and Puru and Turvesu and Drahayu and Anu these words, Ye dear sons, I wish to be a young man and to gratify my appetites in the company of young women. Do you help me therein? To him his eldest son born of Devyani then said, What needest thou, O king? Dost thou want to have your youth? Yayati then told him, Accept thou my decrepitude, O son. With thy youth, I would enjoy myself. During the time of a great sacrifice I have been cursed by the Muni Usanas, Sakra. O son, I would enjoy myself with your youth. Take any of you this my decrepitude and with my body rule ye my kingdom. I would enjoy myself with a renovated body. Therefore, ye my Sons, take ye my decrepitude. But none of his sons accepted his decrepitude. Then his youngest son Puru said unto him, O king, enjoy thyself thou once again with a renovated body and returned youth. I shall take thy decrepitude and at thy command rule thy kingdom. Thus addressed, the royal sage, by virtue of his ascetic power then transferred his own decrepitude unto that high-souled son of his and with the youth of Puru became a youth, while with the monarch's age Puru ruled his kingdom. Then, after a thousand years had passed away, Yayati, that tiger among kings, remained as strong and powerful as a tiger. And he enjoyed for a long time the companionship of his two wives. And in the gardens of Chitrarata, the king of Gandharvs, the king also enjoyed the company of the Apsara Viswaka. But even after all this, the great king found his appetites unsatiated. The king, then recollected the following truths, contained in the Puranas, truly, one's appetites are never satiated by enjoyment. On the other hand, like sacrificial butter poured into the fire, they flame up with indulgence. Even if one enjoyed the whole earth, with its wealth, diamonds, and gold, animals and women, one may not yet be satiated. It is only when man doth not commit any sin in respect of any living thing, in thought, deed, or speech, it is then that he attaineth to purity as that of Brahman. When one feareth nothing, when one is not feared by anything, when one wisheth for nothing, when one injureth nothing, it is then that one attaineth to the purity of Brahman. The wise monarch seeing this and satisfied that one's appetites are never satiated, set his mind at rest by meditation, and took back from his son his own decrepitude, and giving him back his youth, though his own appetites were unsatiated, and installing him on the throne, he spoke unto Pura thus, Thou art my true heir, thou art my true son by whom my race is to be continued. In the world shall my race be known by thy name. Vaisampayana continued, Then that tiger among kings, having installed his son Puru on the throne, went away to the mount of Bhrigu for devoting 
himself to asceticism. And, having acquired great ascetic merit, after long years, he succumbed to the inevitable influence of time. He left his human body by observing the vow of fasting, and ascended to heaven with his wives. Section Lskxi. Samhava Parva continued. Janamejaya said, O thou of the wealth of asceticism, tell me how our ancestor Yayati, who is the tenth from Prajapti, obtained for a wife the unobtainable daughter of Sakra. I desire to hear of it in detail. Tell me. Also, one after another, of those monarchs separately who were the founders of dynasties. Vaisampayana said, the monarch Yayati was in splendour like unto Indra himself. I will tell thee, in reply to thy question, O Janamejaya, how both Sakra and Vrishaparvan bestowed upon him, with due rights, their daughters, and how his union took place with Devyani in special. Between the Celestials and the Azuras, there happened, of your frequent encounters for the sovereignty of the three worlds with everything in them. The gods, then, from desire of victory, installed the son of Angaras, Vrihaspati, as their priest to conduct their sacrifices, while their opponents installed the learned Yusanas as their priest for the same purpose. And between those two Brahmanas there are always much boastful rivalry. Those Danavas assembled for encounter that were slain by the gods were all revived by the seer Sakra by the power of his knowledge. And then starting again, into life dash these fought with the gods. The Azuras also slew on the field of battle many of the celestials. But the open-minded Vrihaspati could not revive them, because he knew not the science called Sanjeevni, revivification, which Kavya endued with great energy knew so well. And the gods were, therefore, in great sorrow. And the gods, in great anxiety of heart and entertaining a fear of the learned Usanas, then went to Kika, the eldest son of Brihaspati, and spoke unto him, saying, We pay court to thee, be kind to us and do us a service that we regard as very great. That knowledge which resides in Sakra, that Brahmana of immeasurable prowess, make thy own as soon as thou canst. Thou shalt find the Brahmana in the court of Vrishaparvan. He always protects the Danavas but never us, their opponents. Thou art his junior in age, and, therefore, capable of adoring him with reverence. Thou canst also adore Devyani, the favorite daughter of that high-souled Brahmana. Indeed, thou alone art capable of propitiating them, both by worship. There is none else that can do so. By gratifying Devyani with thy conduct, liberality, sweetness, and general behavior. Thou canst certainly obtain that knowledge. The son of Brihaspati, thus solicited by the gods, said so be it, and went to where Vrishaparvan was. Kaka, thus sent by the gods, soon went to the capital of the chief of the Azuras, and beheld Sakra there. And beholding him, he thus spoke unto him, Accept me as thy disciple. I am the grandson of the Rishi. Angaras and son of Brihaspati. By name I am known as Kika. Thyself. Becoming my preceptor, I shall practice the Brahmakar Yamod of life for a thousand years. Command me, then, O Brahmana. Sakra, hearing this, said, Welcome art thou, O Kika. I accept thy speech. I will treat thee with regard, for by so doing, it is Vrihaspati. Who will be regarded? Vaisampayana continued, Kika commanded by Kavya or Yuzanas himself. Called also Sakra, then said, So be it, and took the vow he had spoken. Of. And, O Bharata, accepting the vow of which he had spoken, at the. Proper time, 
Kaka began to conciliate regardfully both his preceptor and his daughter, Devyani. Indeed, he began to conciliate both. And as he was young, by singing and dancing and playing on different kinds of instruments, he soon gratified Devyani who was herself in her youth. And, O oh Bharata, with his whole heart set upon it, he soon gratified the maiden Devyani who was then a young lady, by presence of flowers and fruits and services rendered with alacrity. And Devyani also with her songs and sweetness of manners used, while they were alone, to attend upon that youth carrying out his vow. And when five hundred years had thus passed of Kika's vow, the Danavas came to learn his intention. And having no compunctions about slaying a Brahmana, they became very angry with him. And one day they saw Kika in a solitary part of the woods, engaged in tending his preceptor's kind. They then slew Kika from their hatred of Brihaspati and also from their desire of protecting the knowledge of reviving the dead from being conveyed by him. And having slain him, they hacked his body into pieces and gave them to be devoured by jackals and wolves. And, when twilight came, the kind returned to the fold without him who tended them. And Devyani, seeing the kind returned from the woods without Kika, spoke, O Bharata, unto her father thus. Thy evening fire hath been kindled. The sun also hath set, O father. The kind have returned without him who tendeth them. Kaka is, indeed, not to be seen. It is plain that Kaka hath been lost, or is dead. Truly do I say, O father, that without him I will not live. Sakra hearing this said, I will revive him by saying, Let this one come. Then having recourse to the science of reviving the dead, Sakra summoned Kika. And summoned by his preceptor, Kika appeared before him. In the gladness of heart tearing by virtue of his preceptor's science the bodies of the wolves that had devoured him. And asked about the cause of his delay, he thus spoke unto Bhargava's daughter. Indeed, asked by that Brahmin's daughter, he told her, I was dead. O thou of pure manners, burdened with sacrificial fuel, kusa grass and logs of wood, I was coming towards our abode. I sat under a banyan tree. The kind also, having been brought together, were staying under the shade of that same banyan tree. The Azuras, beholding me, asked who art thou? They heard me answer, I am the son of Brihaspati. As soon as I said this, the Danavas slew me, and hacking my body into pieces gave my remains to jackals and wolves. And they then went home in the gladness of heart. Oh! Amiable one, summoned by the high-souled Bhargava, I after all come before thee fully revived. On another occasion, asked by Devyani, the Brahmanakaka went into the woods. And as he was roving about for gathering flowers, the Danavas beheld him. They again slew him, and pounding him into a paste they mixed it with the water of the ocean. Finding him long still, in coming, the maiden again represented the matter unto her father, and summoned again by the Brahmana with the aid of his science, Kaka appearing before his preceptor and his daughter told everything as it had happened. Then, slaying him for the third time and burning him and reducing him to ashes. The Azuras gave those ashes to the preceptor himself, mixing them with his wine. And Devyani again spoke unto her father, saying, O oh father! Kaka was sent to gather flowers. But he is not to be seen. It is plain. He hath been lost, or has died. I tell thee truly, I would not live. Without him. Sakra hearing this said, O oh daughter, the son of Brihaspati hath gone to the region of the dead. Though revived by my science, he is thus slain. 
frequently. What, indeed, am I to do? O Devyani, do not grieve, do not cry. One like thee should not grieve for one that is mortal. Thou art. Indeed, O daughter, in consequence of my prowess, worship thrice a day. During the ordained hours of prayer, by Brahmanas, the gods with Indra. The Vasus, the Aswins, the Asuras, in fact, by the whole universe. It is impossible to keep him alive, for revived by me he is often killed. 2. All this Devyani replied, Why shall I, O father, not grieve for him? Whose grandfather is old Angaras himself, whose father is Vrihaspati who is an ocean of ascetic merit, who is the grandson of Arishi and the son also of Arishi? He himself too was a Brahmacharan and an ascetic, always wakeful and skilled in everything. I will starve and follow the way Kika has gone. The handsome Kika is, O oh father, dear unto me. Vaisampayana continued, the great Rishi Kavya, then, afflicted by what? Devyani said, cried in anger, certainly, the Asuras seek to injure me. For they slay my disciple that stayeth with me. These followers of Rudra desire to divest me of my character as a Brahmana by making me participate in their crime. Truly, this crime hath a terrible end. The crime of slaying a Brahmana would even burn Indra himself. Having said this, the Brahmana Sakra, urged by Devyani, began to summon Kikahu had entered the jaws of death. But Kika, summoned with the aid of science, and afraid of the consequence to his preceptor, feebly replied from within the stomach of his preceptor, saying, Be graceful unto me, O oh Lord! I am Kika that worshipeth thee. Behave unto me as to thy own dearly loved son. Vaisampayana continued, Sakra then said, By what path? O Brahmana! Hast thou entered my stomach, where thou stayest now? Leaving the Asuras. This very moment, I shall go over to the gods. Kika replied, By thy grace, memory hath not failed me. Indeed, I do recollect everything as it hath happened. My ascetic virtues have not been destroyed. It is. Therefore, that I am able to bear this almost insufferable pain. O Kavya! Slain by the Asuras and burnt and reduced to powder, I have been given to thee with thy wine. When thou art present, O Brahmana, the art of the Asuras will never be able to vanquish the science of the Brahmana. Hearing this, Sakra said, O daughter, what good can I do to thee? It is with my death that Kika can get his life back. O Devyani, Kika is even within me. There is no other way of his coming out except by ripping open my stomach. Devyani replied, Both evils shall, like fire, burn me. The death of Kika and thy own death are to me the same. The death of Kika would deprive me of life. If thou also deest, I shall not be able to bear my life. Then Sakra said, O son of Brihaspati, thou art, indeed, one. Already crowned with success, because Devyani regards thee so well. Accept the science that I will today impart to thee, if, indeed, thou be not Indra in the form of Kika. None can come out of my stomach with life. A Brahmana, however, must not be slain, therefore, accept thou the science I impart to thee. Start thou into life as my son, and possessed of the knowledge received from me, and revived by me, take care that, on coming out of my body, thou dost act gracefully. Vaisampayana continued, receiving the science imparted to him by his preceptor the handsome Kika, ripped open his stomach, came out like the moon at evening on the fifteenth day of the bright fortnight. And, beholding the remains of his preceptor lying like a heap of penances, 
Kikar revived him, aided by the science he had learned. Worshipping him. With regard, Kika said unto his preceptor, him who poureth the nectar of knowledge into one's ears, even as thou hast done into those of myself. Who was void of knowledge, him do I regard both as my father and mother. And remembering the immense service done by him, who is there so ungrateful as to injure him. They that, having acquired knowledge, injure their preceptor who is always an object of worship, who is the giver of knowledge, who is the most precious of all precious objects on earth. Come to be hated on earth and finally go to the regions of the sinful. Vaisampayana continued, the learned Sakra, having been deceived while under the influence of wine, and remembering the total loss of consciousness that is one of the terrible consequences of drink, and beholding to before him the handsome Kika whom he had, in a state of unconsciousness, drunk with his wine, then thought of effecting a reform in the manners of Brahmanas. The high-souled Yusanas rising up from the ground in anger, then spoke as follows, the wretched Brahmana who from this day, unable to resist the temptation, will drink wine shall be regarded as having lost his virtue, shall be reckoned to have committed the sin of slaying a Brahmana, shall be hated both in this and the other worlds. I set this limit to the conduct and dignity of Brahmanas. Everywhere. Let the honest, let Brahmanas, let those with regard for their superiors, let the gods, let the three worlds, listen. Having said these words that high-souled one, that ascetic of ascetics, then summoning the Danavas who had been deprived by fate of the good sense, told them these words, Ye foolish Danavas, know ye that Kika hath obtained his wishes. He will henceforth dwell with me. Having obtained the valuable knowledge of reviving the dead, that Brahmana hath, indeed, become in prowess even as Brahman himself. Vaisampayana continued, Bhargava having said so much cut short his speech. The Danavas were surprised and went away to their homes. Kika. 2. Having stayed with his preceptor for a full thousand years, then prepared to return to the abode of the celestials, after having obtained his preceptor's permission. Section Lskci. Samhava Parva continued. Vaisampayana said, after the expiry of the period of his vow, Kika, having obtained his preceptor's leave, was about to return to the abode of the celestials, when Devyani, addressing him, said, O grandson of the Rishi Angaras, in conduct and birth, in learning, asceticism and humility, thou shinest most brightly. As the celebrated Rishi Angaras is honored and regarded by my father, so is thy father regarded and worshipped by me. O thou of ascetic wealth, knowing this, listen to what I say. Recollect my conduct towards thee during the period of thy vow. Brahmakarya. Thy vow hath now been over. It behoveth thee to fix thy affections on me. O oh, accept my hand duly with ordained mantras. Kikar replied, Thou art to me an object of regard and worship even as thy father. O oh, thou of faultless features, thou art, indeed, even an object of greater reverence. Thou art dearer than life to the high-souled. Bhargava, O amiable one! As the daughter of my preceptor, thou art ever worthy of my worship. As my preceptor Sakra, thy father, is ever deserving of my regards, so art thou, O Devyani. Therefore, it behoveth thee not to say so. Hearing this, Devyani replied, Thou, too, art the Son of my father's preceptor's son. Therefore, O best of Brahmanas, thou. The Mahabharata Adi Parva. Section Lskxiv. Samhava Parva continued. Vaisampayana said, Yayati, then, overcome with decrepitude, returned to. 
his capital and summoning his eldest son Yadu who was also the most accomplished, addressed him thus, Dear child, from the curse of Kavya. Called also Usanas, decrepitude and wrinkles and whiteness of hair have come over me. But I have not been gratified yet with the enjoyment of youth. Do thou, O Yadu, take this my weakness along with my decrepitude. I shall enjoy with thy youth. And when a full thousand years will have elapsed, returning to thee thy youth, I shall take back my weakness with this decrepitude. Yadu replied, There are innumerable inconveniences in decrepitude, in respect of drinking and eating. Therefore, O king, I shall not take thy decrepitude. This is, indeed, my determination. White hair on the head. Cheerlessness and relaxation of the nerves, wrinkles all over the body. Deformities, weakness of the limbs, emaciation, incapacity to work. Defeat at the hands of friends and companions these are the consequences. Of decrepitude. Therefore, O king, I desire not to take it. O king, thou hast many sons some of whom are dearer to thee. Thou art acquainted with the precepts of virtue. Ask some other son of thine to take thy decrepitude. Yayati replied, Thou art sprung from my heart, O son, but thou givest me not thy youth. Therefore, thy children shall never be kings. And he continued, addressing another son of his, O Tervesu, Take thou this weakness of mine along with my decrepitude. With thy youth, O son, I like to enjoy the pleasure of life. After the lapse of a full thousand years I shall give back to thee thy youth, and take back from thee my weakness and decrepitude. Tervesu replied, I do not like decrepitude, O father, it takes away all appetites and enjoyments, strength and beauty of person, intellect, and even life. Yayati said to him, Thou art sprung from my heart, O son. But thou givest me not thy youth. Therefore, O Tervesu, thy race shall be extinct. Wretch, thou shall be the king of those whose practices and precepts are impure, amongst whom men of inferior blood procreate. Children upon women of blue blood, who live on meat, who are mean, who hesitate not to appropriate the wives of their superiors, whose practices are those of birds and beasts, who are sinful, and non-Aryan. Vaisampayana said, Yayati, having thus cursed his son Tervesu, then addressed Sarmish the son Drahayu thus, O Drahayu, take thou for a thousand years my decrepitude destructive of complexion and personal beauty and give me thy youth. When a thousand years have passed away, I shall return thee thy youth and take back my own weakness, and decrepitude. To this Drahai replied, O king, one that is decrepit can never enjoy elephants and cars and horses and women. Even his voice. Beko meth horse. Therefore, I do not desire, to take, thy decrepitude. Yayati said to him, Thou art sprung from my heart, O son. But thou, refusest to give me thy youth. Therefore, thy most cherished desires, shall never be fulfilled. Thou shalt be king only in name, of that region, where there are no roads for, the passage of, horses and cars and, elephants, and good vehicles, and asses, and goats and bullocks, and palanquins, where there is swimming only by rafts and floats. Yayati. Next addressed Anu and said, O oh Anu, take my weakness and decrepitude. I shall with thy youth enjoy the pleasures of life for a thousand years. To this Anu replied, Those that are decrepit always eat like children, and are always impure. They cannot pour libations upon fire in proper times. Therefore, I do not like to take thy decrepitude. Yayati said to him, Thou art sprung from my heart, 
Thou givest not thy youth. Thou findest so many faults in decrepitude. Therefore, decrepitude shall overcome thee. And, O Anu, thy progeny also as soon as they attain to youth, shall die. And thou shalt also not be able to perform sacrifices. Before fire, Yayati at last turned to his youngest child, Puru, and addressing him, said, Thou art, O Puru, my youngest son. But thou shalt be the first of all. Decrepitude, wrinkles, and whiteness of hair have come over me in consequence of the curse of Kavya called also Usanas. I have not yet, however, been satiated with my youth. O Puru, take thou this my weakness and decrepitude. With thy youth I shall enjoy for some years the pleasures of life. And when a thousand years have passed away, I shall give back to thee thy youth and take back my own decrepitude. Vaisampayana said, thus addressed by the king, Puru answered with humility, I shall do, O monarch, as thou bidest me. I shall take, O king, thy weakness and decrepitude. Take thou my youth and enjoy as thou listest the pleasures of life. Covered with thy decrepitude and becoming old, I shall, as thou commandest, continue to live, giving thee my youth. Yayati then said, O Puru, I have been gratified with thee. And being gratified, I tell thee that the people in thy kingdom shall have all their desires fulfilled. And having said this, the great ascetic Yayati, then thinking of Kavya, transferred his decrepitude unto the body of the high-souled Puru. Section LXXXV Samhava Parva continued. Vaisampayana said, the excellent monarch Yayati, the son of Nahusha, having received Puru's youth, became exceedingly gratified. And with it, he once more began to indulge in his favorite pursuits to the full extent of his desires and to the limit of his powers, according to seasons, so as to derive the greatest pleasure therefrom. And, O king, in nothing that he did, he acted against the precepts of his religion as behoved him well. He gratified the gods by his sacrifices, the Pitris, by Shraddhas, the poor, by his charities, all excellent Brahmanas, by fulfilling their desires, all persons entitled to the rights of hospitality, with food and drink, the Vaishas, by protection, and the Sudras, by kindness. And the king repressed all criminals by proper punishments. And Yayati, gratifying all sections of his subjects, protected them virtuously like another Indra. And the monarch possessed of the prowess of a lion, with youth, and every object of enjoyment under control, enjoyed unlimited happiness without transgressing the precepts of religion. And the king became very happy in thus being able to enjoy all the excellent objects of his desires. And he was only sorry when he thought that those thousand years would come to an end. And having obtained youth for a thousand years, the king acquainted with the mysteries of time, and watching proper Kolos and Kash that sported with the celestial damsel, Viswaka, sometimes in the beautiful garden of Indra, sometimes in Alaka, the city of Kavira, and sometimes on the summit of the mountain Meru on the north. And when the virtuous monarch saw that the thousand years were full, he summoned his son, Puru, and addressed him thus, O oppressor of foes, with thy youth, O son, I have enjoyed the pleasures of life, each according to its season to the full extent of my desires, to the limit of my powers. Our desires, however, are never gratified by indulgence. On the other hand, with indulgence, they only flame up like fire with libations of sacrificial butter. If a single person were owner of everything on earth all her yields of patty and barley, her silver, gold, and gems, 
her animals and women, he would not still be content. Thirst of enjoyment, therefore, should be given up. Indeed, true happiness belongeth to them that have cast off their thirst. For worldly objects a thirst which is difficult to be thrown off by the wicked and the sinful, which faileth not with the failing life, and which is truly the fatal disease of man. My heart hath for a full thousand years been fixed upon the objects of desires. My thirst for these, however, increaseth day by day without abating. Therefore, I shall cast it off, and fixing my mind on Brahma I shall pass the rest of my days with the innocent deer in the forest peacefully and with no heart for any worldly objects. And O Puru, I have been exceedingly gratified with thee. Prosperity be thine. Receive back this thy youth. Receive thou also my kingdom. Thou art, indeed, that son of mine who has done me the greatest services. Vaisampayana continued, then Yayati, the son of Nahusha, received back his decrepitude. And his son Puru received back his own youth. And Yayati was desirous of installing Puru, his youngest son, on the throne. But the four orders, with the Brahmanas at their head, then addressed the monarch. Thus, O king, how shalt thou bestow thy kingdom on Puru, passing over thy eldest son Yadu born of Devyani, and, therefore, the grandson of the great Sakra? Indeed, Yadu is thy eldest son after him hath been born. Turvesu, and of Sarmishtha's sons, the first is Drahayu, then Anu and then Puru. How doth the youngest deserve the throne, passing all his elder brothers over? This we represent to thee. O, oh, conform to virtuous practice. Yayati then said, Ye four orders with Brahmanas at their head, hear my words as to why my kingdom should not be given to my eldest son. My commands have been disobeyed by my eldest son, Yadu. The wise say that he is no son who disobeyeth his father. That son, however, who doth the bidding of his parents, who seek their good, who is agreeable to them, is indeed, the best of sons. I have been disregarded by Yadu and by Tervesu. 2. Much I have been disregarded by Drahayu and by Anu also. By Puru alone hath my word been obeyed. By him have I been much regarded. Therefore, the youngest shall be my heir. He took my decrepitude. Indeed. Puru is my friend. He did what was so agreeable to me. It hath also been commanded by Sakra himself, the son of Kavi, that that son of mine who should obey me will become king after me and bring the whole earth under his sway. I, therefore, beseech thee, let Puru be installed on the throne. The people then said, True it is, O king, that, that son who is accomplished and who seek the good of his parents, deserveth prosperity even if he be the youngest. Therefore, doth Puru who hath done the good, deserve the crown. And as Sakra himself hath commanded it, we have nothing to say to it. Vaisampayana continued, the son of Nahusha, thus addressed by the contented people, then installed his son, Puru, on the throne. And having bestowed his kingdom on Puru, the monarch performed the initiatory ceremonies for retiring into the woods. And soon after he left his capital, followed by Brahmanas and ascetics. The sons of Yadu are known by the name of the Yadvas, while those of Tervesu have come to be called the Yavnas. And the sons of Drahayu are the Bhojas, while those of Anu, the Mlechchas. The progeny of Puru, however, are the Puravas, amongst whom, O monarch, thou art born, in order to rule for a thousand years with thy passions under complete control. Section Lskse Samhava Parva continued. 
Vaisampayana said, King Yayati, the son of Nahusha, having thus installed his dear son on the throne, became exceedingly happy, and entered into the woods to lead the life of a hermit. And having lived for some time into forest in the company of Brahmanas, observing many rigid vows, eating fruits and roots, patiently bearing privations of all sorts, the monarch at last ascended to heaven. And having ascended to heaven he lived there in bliss. But soon, however, he was hurled down by Indra. And it hath been heard by me, O king, that, though hurled from heaven, Yayati, without reaching the surface of the earth, stayed in the firmament. I have heard that some time after he again entered the region of the celestials in company with Vasuman, Ashtaka, Pratardana, and Sivi. Janamjaya said, I desire to hear from thee in detail why Yayati, having first obtained admission into heaven, was hurled therefrom, and why also he gained readmittance. Let all this, O Brahmana, be narrated by thee in the presence of these regenerate sages. Yayati, Lord of Earth, was, indeed, like the chief of the celestials, the progenitor of the extensive race of the Kurus, he was of the splendour of the sun. I desire to hear in full the story of his life both in heaven and on earth, as he was illustrious, and of worldwide celebrity and of wonderful achievements. Vaisampayana said, Indeed, I shall recite to thee the excellent story of Yayati's adventures on earth and in heaven. That story is sacred and destroyeth the sins of those that hear it. King Yayati, the son of Nahusha, having installed his youngest son, Guru, on the throne after casting his sons with Yadu for their eldest, amongst the Mlechchas, entered the forest to lead the life of a hermit. And the king eating fruits and roots lived for some time in the forest. Having his mind and passions under complete control, the king gratified by sacrifices the Pitris and the gods. And he poured libations of clarified butter upon the fire according to the rites prescribed for those leading the Vinaprasth the mode of life. And the illustrious one entertained guests and strangers with the fruit of the forest and clarified butter, while he himself supported life by gleaning scattered corn seeds. And the king led this sort of life for a full thousand years. And observing the vow of silence and with mind under complete control he passed one full year, living upon air alone and without sleep. And he passed another year practicing the severest austerities in the midst of four fires around and the sun overhead. And, living upon air alone, he stood erect upon one leg for six months. And the king of sacred deeds ascended to heaven, covering heaven as well as the earth, with the fame of his achievements. Dot. Section Lskci. Samhava Parva continued. Vaisampayana said, while that king of kings dwelt in heaven the home of the celestials, he was reverenced by the gods, the Sathyas, the Maruts, and the Vasus of sacred deeds, and mind under complete control. The monarch used to repair now and then from the abode of the celestials unto the region of Brahman. And it hath been heard by me that he dwelt for a long time in heaven. One day that best of kings, Yayati, went to Indra and there in course of conversation the Lord of Earth was asked by Indra as follows. What didst thou say, O king, when thy son Puru took thy decrepitude on earth and when thou gavest him thy kingdom? Yayati answered, I told him that the whole country between the rivers Gunga and Yamuna was his. That is, indeed, the central region of the earth, while the outlying regions are to be the dominions of thy brothers. I also told him that those without anger were ever superior to those under its sway, those disposed to forgive were ever superior to the unforgiving. Man is superior to the lower animals. Among men again the 
learned are superior to the unlearned. If wronged, thou shouldst not. Wrong in return. One's wrath, if disregarded, burneth one's own self, but. He that regardeth it not taketh away all the virtues of him that. Exhibiteth it. Never shouldst thou pain others by cruel speeches. Never. Subdue thy foes by despicable means, and never utter such scorching and sinful words as may torture others. He that pricketh as if with thorns. Men by means of hard and cruel words, thou must know, ever carrieth in his mouth the racks hosses. Prosperity and luck fly away at his very sight. Thou shouldst ever keep the virtuous before thee as thy models, thou shouldst ever with retrospective I compare thy acts with those of the virtuous, thou shouldst ever disregard the hard words of the wicked, thou shouldst ever make the conduct of the wise the model upon which thou art to act thyself. The man hurt by the arrows of cruel speech hurled from one's lips weepeth day and night. Indeed, these strike at the core of the body. Therefore the wise never fling these arrows at others. There is nothing in the three worlds by which thou canst worship and adore the deities better than by kindness, friendship, charity, and sweet speeches. Unto all. Therefore, shouldst thou always utter words that soothe, and not those that scorch. And thou shouldst regard those that deserve, thy Regards, and shouldst always give but never beg. Section Lskseath. Samhava Parva continued. Vaisampayana said, Alter this Indra again, asked Yayati, thou didst. Retire into the woods, O king, after accomplishing all thy duties. O oh. Yayati, son of Nahusha, I would ask thee to whom thou art equal in ascetic austerities. Yayati answered, O Vasva, I do not, in the matter of ascetic austerities, behold my equal among men, the celestials, the Gandharvs, and the great rishis. Indra then said, O monarch, because thou disregardest those that are thy superiors, thy equals, and even thy inferiors, without, in fact, knowing their real merits, thy virtues have Suffered diminution and thou must fall from heaven. Yayati then said, O oh, Sakra, if, indeed, my virtues have really sustained diminution and I must on that account fall down from heaven, I desire, O oh chief of the celestials, that I may at least fall among the virtuous and the honest. Indra replied, O oh king, thou shall fall among those that are virtuous and wise and thou shall acquire also much renown. And after this experience of thine, O Yayati, never again disregard those that are thy superiors or even thy equals. Vaisampayana continued, Upon this, Yayati fell from the region of the celestials. And as he was falling, he was beheld by that foremost of royal sages, viz. Ashtaka, the protector of his own religion. Ashtaka, beholding him, inquired, Who art thou, O youth of a beauty equal to that of Indra, in splendor blazing as the fire, thus falling from on high? Art thou that foremost of sky-ranging bodies the sun emerging from dark masses of clouds? Beholding thee falling from the solar course, possessed of immeasurable energy and the splendor of fire or the sun, Everyone is curious as to what it is that is so falling, and is, besides, deprived of consciousness. Beholding thee in the path of the celestials, possessed of energy like that of Sakra, or Surya, or Vishnu, we have approached thee to ascertain the truth. If thou hast first asked us who we were, we would never have been guilty of the incivility of asking thee first. We now ask thee who thou art and why thou approachest. Hither. Let thy fears be dispelled, let thy woes and afflictions cease. Thou art now in the presence of the virtuous and the wise. Even Sakra, himself the slayer of Vala cannot here do thee any injury. O thou of 
the prowess of the chief of the celestials, the wise and the virtuous are. The support of their brethren in grief. Here there are none but the wise. And virtuous like thee assembled together. Therefore, stay thou herein. Peace. Fire alone hath power to give heat. The earth alone hath power to infuse life into the seed. The sun alone hath power to illuminate everything. So the guest alone hath power to command the virtuous and the wise. Section 6.